for my talk. My name is Martin. I work for Pivotal. That's the company behind the Pivotal Cloud Foundry and this, all the Spring frameworks and Spring teams are there uh, around many other stuff. Um, I work for the Spring Group and I work for the Spring Tooling team. So I lead the stuff that's around the Spring Tool Suite, the Eclipse-based Spring Tooling or the Eclipse-based distribution focused on Spring Tooling. Um, so what I would like to talk about is the language server protocol and the stuff that we're doing with that and our experiences and share them with you. So first question is, who, who knows what the LSP, the language server protocol is? Yes. Okay, great, perfect. Cool, let's dive into the details. Uh, so you all know that, right? You all know language server protocol, it makes a dif differentiation between the client the client, which is kind of the editor or the IDE or the front end, and the server, which is not really a server in the sense of a cloud server machine sitting somewhere over the other end of the wire, um, but just a, another process on your machine where you, where, to which your tool communicates um, and hands over, let's say, the, the language knowledge. So. The tool of the client, the editor, becomes sort of stupid, can only do syntax highlighting and stuff like that, the basic stuff. And the real knowledge about the language, that's captured in a separate process. In this case, for example, for JSON. Right? There's a separate process running in the language server for JSON, knows everything about JSON, can do everything about that, and delivers the features to the, I, to the, to the client, to the, to the editor, um, by communicating uh, JSON messages forth and back. Right, that, that, sounds, that sounds easy, and actually it is not that complicated, right? It is quite easy. Uh, if you take a look into the details of the protocol, there are messages going forth and back between those processes, between the client side, the editor, the IDE, whatever that is, and the servers, there can be multiple servers, one for JSON, or one for C Sharp, or maybe even multiple ones for C Sharp, or whatever, it's up to you. And they can communicate, for example, if you open a file, if you make changes, um, the client notifies the server of those changes and those files and the client can send things back like hey I have problems and warnings and errors for you I have code completion if you send me a request for code completion give you code completion back and things like that so you really start to put all the, no the deep language knowledge about the tooling into these isolated uh, language server processes and you communicate with this protocol, and this protocol is s sort of standardized right, by Visual Studio Code or by the team behind Visual Studio Code that uh, invented that. So you, you can use that yourself, right? It started all with VS Code, Visual Studio Code, where you can write your own extensions. And if you want to write your own extension for VS Code, you can do that in TypeScript and add your extension like a plugin to VS Code. And you can build that as a language server. So you can extract your stuff, write that not in TypeScript, but in another language, and connect that to VS Code, and let VS Code learn about, let's say, Java, or learn about specific YAML files, or things like that. Um, so that, that's what we did, because we thought this, this might solve a lot of our problems with doing spring tooling all the time for Eclipse, because we only do that for Eclipse, right? So we, we implement these, these huge Eclipse plugins all the time. We know, I don't think we know everything about the Eclipse API, but we know a lot about the Eclipse API, but we don't know, don't know much about the NetBeans API. We don't, not, we don't know anything about the IntelliJ API, and, and we would have to build everything again, things like that. So we thought this might be an interesting approach for us going forward. Um, and we started small, so we built language service that you can already use and download. So we implemented language service in Java for Cloud Foundry manifest files. So it's kind of a YAML dialect. Uh, for Concourse CI, it's a CI system, like Jenkins and Hudson, but more advanced based on Docker stuff. Um, and you can, can hack your stuff up as, as uh, YAML files again. So we built a language server for that. We built a language server for Bosch. It's kind of the manifest administration language for uh, big cloud clusters for Cloud Foundry, um, and we work on more. Of course, as you can imagine, I work for the Spring Tooling. You might have an idea what we are going to work on next after these little language servers for all these YAML dialects. Um, but that's the background, right? 
You can use them for VS Code already if you want to. And we collected some experiences. And the goal for me is to share my experiences with you and talk a little bit about what's good, what's bad, and what's maybe a little bit, little bit ugly behind the scenes if you do a language server, uh, the language server protocol. So the good, let's start with the good parts, right? Always start with the good parts. I promise you to end with some, some good parts in the end too, but let's get started with the good parts. And the first thing that was really great for us is you can write your stuff once, right? You can really focus on the things that you are great at if you are a language developer, for example. If you're great at, you invented um, Ruby or you in invented Go, right? what do you do? Usually people who use Go or use Ruby or use Java, the next question they are going to ask you is, hey, where do I get this plugin for Eclipse or this plugin for IntelliJ? And do Atom support that already? And where, where can I get this code completion from? You say, ah, oh, yeah, okay, let's build up a, a team of 30 people and, and implementing plugins for all the different IDEs out there with all the specific APIs for every single IDE and every single editor out there in the world. Let's build that all from scratch. And sometimes you end up building really strange stuff. Uh, but it's a lot of work. So the great stuff with a language server protocol is you can build that once, right? Because there's a standardized protocol in between you and the IDE and the client. You can talk that protocol and everything what that protocol allows you to do, you can do. And you can write. And this is great for us because we are sort of, we are experts for Spring and we want to build great Spring tooling. We don't want to tell you which IDE you should use to build your Spring app if you want to, want to build Spring Enterprise apps. Right? We don't want to tell you, oh, this only works in Eclipse. Or, uh, yeah, there is something similar in IntelliJ, but that's different. Right? You have to learn different, different things. Or it's different support in IntelliJ than in Eclipse. Or, oh, you're, you're using Sublime Text? Uh, sorry. Come back in 10 years from now when we ended up building specific Sublime support for Spring, or something like that. So with LSP, you can really build that once and use that in all the clients that support the language server protocol. And we can really focus on the stuff that we are good at. We're good at Spring. Um, some other people may be good at Go, and they can build the Go support and understand the Go language and build it. And that's really, I think, a huge step forward for us as toolsmiths, right? We built tools for, for Spring. We want to build that. And now we have the option to more or less build that once and give it to you, and you can use it in more or less, or at least I hope in the future, in more or less any environment, in any, edi any editor you prefer for your daily work, which I think is great. Um, the second benefit of that is uh, once you start building your language servers, you can build those language servers in the language of your choice because it's a separate process. The client has no idea how you build the language server internally. If you build that with JavaScript or uh, Python or, or Java or Go or whatever, you can choose a language of your choice. So that sounds okay, maybe not super crazy because maybe we're all Java developers and we, we love Java. We love to do everything in Java, but if you start up building, oh yeah, let's build a, a, a C, C++ C++ and C sharp parser, uh, rewrite that in Java. Uh, it already exists in, in, in Clang, in, in other environments, but we cannot really use that because it's written in, in C sharp or C++ or whatever. Let's do that again in Java because we need to plug that into Eclipse and Eclipse is running on the JVM, so let's do that as a Java thing. That's really stupid, right? It's really crazy. Uh, but that happened in, in the past. <laughs> Yeah, Doug, Doug can, can, can sing a long, long song about that, right? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, and the same, the same for, for the JavaScript guys. Right? The JavaScript guys, they, they, they started to kind of, in the end, they, 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 uh, first they build up these kind of JavaScript parts in, in Java, and then they say, oh, yeah, that's crazy. We have great JavaScript, so let's start up a JavaScript engine inside of Eclipse and use the JavaScript, implemented JavaScript parser inside of that, and then bridge it over again, and things like that. So it's, it's, really, it's really strange. And if I implement a language or framework, it's really quite natural for me to implement parsing and support for that in that language, actually. And that's what, what many, many people are doing for languages. It's 
themselves anyway. They start to build their, the compiler for the language in the language itself someday and so on. So that's really, it's really great. Um, and what's also a nice side effect of that is that you can start to use the libraries of your choice. So whenever you think, oh, I really love to use this kind of, this small little library over there, you can just use it. It's a separate process, yeah? You, you can use whatever library you want and run that. You don't have to worry about, is this OSGI compatible and does it run with different class loaders and different versions if someone else is using a different version already in your Eclipse installation or has installed that five years ago and now you cannot really upgrade because there's a strange dependency to some other piece in your IDE that is using a different version of that. Um, it's gone, right? You can use a small, lightweight library of your choice. And that's, that's really nice. Um, the other good thing is, if you start to build your language servers, you don't have to start from scratch. As I showed you, they, they, the language servers, they communicate with the server, uh, with the client, um, s talking JSON. And there's a protocol, right? JSON messages, specific JSON messages. You cannot send random stuff forth and back, right? You get it specific protocol, specific messages forth and back um, using JSON or PC, but you don't have to implement all that yourself. They are ready to use libraries out there already. If you start, uh, if you want to build your stuff uh, using JavaScript or TypeScript, there's a, a node library uh, for the LSP already from, from VS Code there. If you want to build your language server in Java, there is the LSP4J project at Eclipse that implements this protocol and gives you a nice Java API for talking for talking to the client if you build a server, or vice versa, right? If you build a client in Java, it can also do that on the other side to talk with the server. Um, but you don't have to take care about both sides running on the same language, right? It's not, ne not necessary. You can use the, the node layer, you can use a node, and VS Code is written in TypeScript and whatever, and the server is written in Java. So that's, that's really, I think it's really great. Um, and what, what, what our experience with that is, it really starts to become a pleasure to test those language servers. Because they are so isolated by design, it's a separate process, and the only thing they know about the world from, from the editor side is what they get as messages, as JSON messages, and the file system, right? So it's really easy to set up a test case Right? You just start up your, your, your language server, you feed specific messages in, and you observe if the right messages came out of, uh, come out of that language server, if that kind of behaves nicely and behaves correctly. So this kind of black box testing of this language tooling is really, really nice. Of course, I would not say, yeah, forget about everything else and forget about unit tests and every kind of detail. Of course, you, you should do all that. But these kind of outside, more integration side testing to see if this real black box language server behaves nicely and correct is really, is really nice. It's easy to implement because you can just create those messages, feed the language server with those messages in the right sequence, and you can see if the right messages in the right sequence, if they come back to you and if they contain the right thing and the right stuff. It's really, really nice. Um, and what is also nice about this design, about this running things as a separate process is that some side effects of, of clients, um, they do not happen anymore, right? In Eclipse, it's, it's really easy. For example, if you build a plugin and you do the wrong stuff, it hangs your complete user experience. Eclipse hangs. The UI thread hangs because you do stuff in the UI thread because you get called with some callback from some extension point um, and you forgot about oh, I do some, some more, more advanced stuff and I should do them in a separate thread and a separate job and then report that back in the UI thread and whatever. Uh, if you do that in a, in a wrong way and do some network access, for example, that happens for us sometimes, right? We, we did network access, uh, fetch some stuff from the server and then we forgot, forgot about, oh, this is called in this very specific, could be called in a very specific context from the UI thread. Network was down or network had problems, UI, freezes. It's really, it's a really shitty user experience. Uh, this cannot happen in this model because the communication with the language server is async by default, by nature. Right? So everything happens in an async nature. 
You don't have to take care of that yourself anymore. Uh, it's done by the, by the client, right? Every call to the language server is async. Uh, and it comes back, or it doesn't come back in time. Um, but you cannot really, let's say, destroy the user experience and cause a big hang. And if it crashes, if your language server crashes for some reason, hey, it crashes. It doesn't crash the, the process of the IDE, of the editor, of the client side. That stays the same. In some situations, uh, when you build a, a little language, tiny little language server that starts up fast, sometimes you do, don't even notice that the language server crashed or went away. It just gets restarted under the hood, this tiny little process, and everything is good as before. Really nice. Really nice. Another interesting side effect for that is, especially when we think about implementing language servers in Java, is also the fact that you can specify the way this Java VM is launched yourself somehow. Right? So the way the JVM is launched, you can specify that. You can write that, that piece of code. Um, and that means that you can also influence how the JVM is started. So you can set specific arguments, specific JVM options, for example, for specific language service individually. If you say, for example, oh, this language server has a maximum heap size of one gigabyte, and that's it, it's not allowed to consume more. If it cons starts to consume more, it crashes or goes down away. When uh, it's going down or it goes away, that's okay, but it doesn't destroy your whole user experience in the client or for the other language servers. They can still run. If you think, oh, these other language servers, they, 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 that should just consume 100 megabytes in the machine, you can specify that too, right? Because they are all independent of each other. I think a nice side effect. Um, the, this language server protocol is defined, as I said, by, by the VS Code guys, and they maintain that. Um, so it's also it's not only a great possibility, it's also a great limitation, right? Because you, you can only do what the protocol tells you is available to you. But you can extend the protocol if you want to. So it's open. You can customize it. You can tell, oh, I would like to send additional messages forth and back. Of course, there are downsides because if you send custom messages forth and back, you kind of lose these write runs run anywhere uh, benefit because the client side doesn't know anything about the, the, the message that you send back. You need to write some code on the client side that does something with that message. So that's kind of the, the downside, but it is open and it's possible to do that, which I think is important, um, important for the language server protocol. Let's talk about the bad parts. What I, at least what I think are the bad parts. It's just my opinion, right? It's not a globally trusted talk. It's uh, just my opinion. And we can discuss about that. Uh, by the way, I forgot to, to, to say, if you have questions or comments or whatever, feel free to ask any time, right? I'm happy to answer questions in between, you don't have to wait until the end and remember everything. The bad parts. Um, one of the one of the bad parts that, that we observe, especially when we do when we try to build the uh, spring tooling, um, is the language server might have to do the work twice. Right? In our in our case, we have, uh, for example, VS Code and we have the Java language server installed in VS Code, or you have the Java language server installed in VS Code. So the Java language server does all the Java stuff, right? It parses Java code and compiles that and analyzes that and does code completion for that. that that's all great. On the other side, there's, let's say, our Spring language server that's also interested in taking a look at your Java code because it tries to find annotations, Spring annotations, and tries to help you with Spring annotations, for example but it has no idea about this Java language. In Eclipse, we used all these great Java model APIs and ASTs and parsers and everything that was around. It was just, it was just let's say, a, a one-liner to say, hey, give me the AST of this Java piece uh, when you do content assist, and then you get everything. But now, our language server, what do we do? We are staring at a text file, basically. That's what we get from the protocol, right? We get a text file, and that's it. We have to build our own knowledge and our own understanding of that text file ourselves. So 
So what we end up doing is we parse the Java code too to create an AST and to analyze some stuff. So that's great for mod modularity, right? So we can stuff independently of the other thing and if JDT or the Java language server is broken or whatever, we can do something else. Uh, so it's, it's great for modularity, but in the end, um, the work on your machine is done twice, or maybe three times or four times, but <laughs> it depends on how many language servers you install, that they are all interested in parsing Java code. Of course, internally, we reuse a library, so relax, we haven't written our own Java parser again, uh, so we <laughs> of course reused an existing one to build an AST, but uh, so it's not really from our implementer's point of view doubling the work, but from consuming the CPU on your machine, it's doubling the work, right? Because it is resolving the class path and trying to find the Java project and resolving the class path and analyzing the Java files inside and parsing code and resolving types. So that happens twice. Yeah, question. The question is, can my server be the client for another server? Um, technically, of course, that could be possible. I'm just not sure if it makes sense or, or what, we, we haven't really tried that, what's faster. Is it faster to parse the source code ourselves or is it faster to try to talk to the other language, to the Java language server, for example, and make a custom extension to that, ask it for, for an AST, for example, serialize the AST into a JSON message, send it over the wire, it's not really a wire, it's just in the process, right? Deserialize it on the other end and then for us take a look at that. Of course, you would save the time of parsing the code, but you would spend the time on serializing, deserializing, transferring all the stuff. So I doubt that that would be a benefit um, of talking to the other one. But in, indeed, I think it's an open question in this language server world whether those language servers should communicate among each other, maybe, and play this client server role among each other, too. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, it, I don't have an answer. It's also an open question for me. I doubt that it makes sense for the parsing the Java code, but it could make a lot of sense for indexes and having uh, whatever, all types indexed and things like that. That maybe also consume your memory in, on your machine, right? Yeah. Uh, another, another interesting question for us is, do we end up running all these processes on your machine uh, and killing your machine, basically? At the moment, uh, the language server protocol is quite sort of limit, limited to a workspace, and if you use that in Eclipse with L LSP4E, the Eclipse integration, it's kind of, it's one language server per project. So if you, have a pro if you have 100 projects in your workspace and you work on all of them, so let's say, let's say you have a file open, that's, that's the main trigger, right? You have to have an editor open, so you have to really work on that. If you have an edit a file open from each project, you end up having 100 processes for 100 different language servers on your machine at the moment, right? And I'm a little bit, little bit concerned about your tiny little laptop sitting over there and starting up 100 JVMs for 100 language servers that we've all written in Java and, <laughs> and parsing code or whatever. Um, interesting question. There's, there's an, uh, an addition to the language server coming up uh, to support like what's called multi-root workspaces, we have a workspace that can, we have one language server supporting multiple workspaces and that could be adopted by Eclipse. So there are solutions uh, that you can already see at the horizon quite nicely for that. But you have to take care inside of the language server that this language server supports that. Right? So you have to build your language server in a way that it can deal with these, oh, I don't take a look at one project, I now take a look at 100 maybe isolated projects or maybe connected projects. Interesting, interesting challenge for the Eclipse integration as well as for the language servers. But at least there's kind of a, a solution, a solution down the road. Um, another interesting, um, interesting effect of this language server protocol is you build a language server and typically a server is a server. And the server does not have any UI. That's, uh, that's, that's all the, 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 that's by purpose, right? But if you build tooling support for your language or whatever, you might 
want to have specific UIs one day. Maybe you want to have configuration options. What do you do about them? Start up building your own UIs again for every client? Hmm. It's interesting. The VS Code guys, they really go down the road of whatever you have to configure in your language server, do that in a JSON file and then send the configuration over and then and configure that from the outside, so that's great. But we came into the situation where we have to jump on the client side and build some specific UI things around that on the client side, which is okay, you can still do that, right? It's not a technical limitation, but it's just a, a limitation of this, of this model. Uh, yeah, and I already talked about the, the protocol extensions. They are possible, so that's good. Downside is, if you build a protocol extension, you have to build the client-side support yourself for every client that you would like to support. So you sort of lose, lose these, the, the benefit of write once and run, in, run for any client. Uh, the good thing is you can, you can discuss that with a client. So there's, uh, there's there are options in the protocol built in to say, oh, this server has these capabilities and the client has these capabilities and they kind of negotiate what's <laughs> what should be possible and what not. So that's good. Um, but if you want to support that, you have to build that for the client too. Okay. Let's take a look at the ugly parts. The really ugly part from, from what we experienced is that the language server protocol is great. It's awesome. And of course, our language servers are awesome too. Of course, right? Uh, but, and, and we, we had the idea of, oh, now we can run them any, anywhere, right? Doesn't matter. We put them in VS Code, we put them in Eclipse, and we put them in Atom, and we put them everywhere. And it's all the same. And in the end, it's not the same, right? Because every client is different. And that might be, a situation that's kind of that's just that happens just now and as the clients evolve and their LSP support evolves maybe they they become more mature and they all behave the same but at least at the moment and I think that will stay the same for at least the next year maybe the next several years in the end you have to test your language server in all the clients you want to support or you would like to behave them nicely. You need to test them against all the clients. This black box testing is great for your functionality, right? But to get an idea about the user experience, if that really behaves nicely for the, from the user point of view, are the hovers rendered nicely? Is the content is showing up in the right order? Uh, are the hovers, are the multiple hovers supported in the right order? Do they show up nicely? Is the indentation correct? And all those things, you have to test it against every single client. And that's, that, that really becomes a nightmare sometimes because if you implement a feature and you end up testing that manually against all the clients. I hope that will, will be better in the future, but I think that's a, at least at the moment, that's quite a downside. Yeah, there's a question. That's, um, that's exactly the bridge to my next slide. Thank you for the question. <laughs> the question was, is that a limitation of the protocol? So is the protocol not precise enough? Or is it kind of a natural, let's say, limitation on the client side? Um, in certain situations, the protocol is not yet precise enough. So there's kind of the, the VS Code guys, they implemented that, and they implemented that for whatever, whatever fits their needs. And in, in some situations, it's quite open, quite flexible, which is good, right? That's great. Uh, so you can put a text snippet in, or if you put code completion in, you can, can put code completion in. So that's great. Please insert this text. That's awesome. You can insert anything. And then you have multiple lines in a code completion, right? You would like to insert not just a word or a method call or whatever, but you would like to insert multiple lines. And then, you can do that, right? That's great. But VS Code applies some kind of, what they say is magic indentation, because they apply the indentation of the line that you started the code completion for every line that's inserted automatically for you. Right? So you don't have to take care of your inserted text of this indentation. You can forget about that. But 
That's not happening in another client. That's not in, in Atom, that's not going to happen. Atom, just say, yeah, I insert the tag that you, that you return me, and you know everything about the structure of the snippet that I should insert as a result of the code completion, and I don't think I'm smart enough to know what you would like to insert. You are the language guy. You know everything about the structure. And then you end up saying, uh, huh, huh, I would like to get the indentation correct in the end. I don't care how that works. Right? Because the user experience point of view is, hey, I would like to get the indentation correct if I insert multiple lines in a text snippet or a code completion. Um, so one way is ask a question. So what, what, what does the language of the protocol really mean? And that what, that's what's, what's going on all the time, right? There are different questions about does this protocol means in this end that this result string should be this or should be that, or can I insert X or can I insert, insert Y? And then it's kind of clarification going on, the protocol is being refined, more documentation put in. So that's kind of the, the natural evolution of the protocol, make it more clear, less room for interpretation. On the other side, it's sometimes saying, no, the client say, no, 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 we, we are smart enough to do the intonation. Uh, the other clients should do that too. And if then it's up to the client to implement the, or support the LSP protocol to do the same or to do whatever they think is the smartest way to do that, we end up implementing feature flags. So we end up implementing feature flags for, our, for inside of our language servers so that we know if, the if this language server started with flags A, B, C, then we don't do magic indentation and we don't do X, Y, Z. But if this language server started with feature flag uh, X, Y, and Z, then we do magic indentation in the return code completion for you and we do these five other things because these feature flag we can we can manage those feature flags for each client individually and then say we get the right user experience out of that so that in the end from the user's perspective it all behaves the same and the user doesn't see the client do the indentation or is the server doing the indentation but it's i think it's an problematic part. It's, an, it's a hard thing to engineer because you have to test that and, and actually implement that right, at the moment. I also think that that will get better over time. The more clients evolve, the more the protocol evolves, it gets better and those situations become less frequently. But I think it will, there will always be some, some room for interpretation. Oh, there was another question maybe? Uh, yeah. Uh, the question is how do we manage that? How we do we deal with these different clients having different settings or different behavior? We have these feature flags. So we more or less implement both. We implement, uh, we have a flag inside of the server that says if this flag is enabled, the server, the language server, will check what the indentation of the current line is and apply that indentation to all the other lines that it inserts in the returned completion text. If this flag is false, then it doesn't do anything about indentation. It just assumes this is plain and the client will take care of that. And we, we set the feature flag dependent on the client. So if we start that in Atom, we set the flag to true, we start the, uh, the client in VS Code, we set the flag to false. But it's kind of it's feature flagging for the index. Yeah. In the, in the end, in the end, it boils down to the language server knows something about the clients and knows something about I, for example, for code completion or for text snippets, I need to behave differently. I need to behave this way, that way, or that way. And I need to make the switch between these three different ways to 
deliver a content assist depending on the client. However, you identify the client. If it's a kind of uh, the name of the client that's delivered by the connection or a feature flag or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you have to write a little bit of glue code. And that's that's ugly too. I don't like that. I hate writing glue code. The, it's, it's not it's not a big deal. It's just a small piece of code, but you have to write this little piece of code to actually start up the language server on the client side. That's not specified, right? There's no unique format to implement a language server. There's a format to implement an extension for VS Code, and there's a format for building a plugin for Eclipse, and there's a format to build a plugin for IntelliJ and for Atom, and there are libraries that help you start up a language server and, s and communicate, but you have to write this little piece of code in Eclipse, you implement an extension point, in VS Code, you implement a VS Code extension. You write a little bit of piece of code to start up your language server in the right way and communicate with it. It's not a big deal, right? It's a tiny little bit, but you have to maintain that for every client. Okay, so coming to the end, uh, I still think LSP is the way the way to go. So up to now, we are really, really happy with that, and we think this is absolutely the right way to go forward to build our own language tooling and for us, it's more framework tooling than language tooling because we're not building a language. We're building frameworks and APIs for enterprise apps using Spring, but it's, it's really great. Okay, um, that's it. Time is over. Uh, if you have any questions, maybe we can steal one more minute from the break, but otherwise I'm still here up to Friday afternoon, so feel free to meet and ask questions. Any more questions now? Otherwise, thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.